There's a song in my soul And I feel it stirring in me This I know for sure That your love is like a flood And your mercy never ending I give my song to you There's a joy in my soul great to be with you this morning. I was thinking of Psalm 92 this morning. I want to read this for us even as we begin. Psalm 92 is titled, A Psalm, A Song for the Sabbath. The psalmist writes, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. We stand together. We're here to celebrate the Lord this morning, to declare his steadfast love. Let me pray for us. Father, we're grateful to be in your presence this morning. And Lord, we know that as we've come together as your body, Lord, you are here. God, your Holy Spirit resides within us, and we, we recognize that this morning as your people. God, I pray for our time together this morning that you would reveal yourself to us as you please. 
Lord, help us to come with humble hearts before you, ready to receive what you have to give us this morning. God, we are grateful for another day to be together. Lord, we sing of your steadfast love this morning. We remind ourselves of that, of who we are in you. We remind each other of that as we've come to do this corporately and together. God, we pray that even as your word is taught this morning and is read this morning, you would feed us from your word. Jesus, we love you. That's why we're here this morning. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.
Join me in prayer. Dear Jesus, we are privileged to call upon you. Given the power that you have of bringing heaven and earth together through your death and resurrection, you showed us life. You give us life. And your name is more powerful than any, whether we want to believe it or not, or our friends want to believe it or not, our coworkers. You are who you are. Our Heavenly Father sent you to restore us back into relationship with you. And we thank you that you give us that hope. In brokenness, you are our healer. Healing of our minds, our bodies, our spirits, you bring us back to the way you want us to be with our Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray for us now, but I pray for this whole morning as a series of people will be saying, I believe in you. I call on your name and I believe you, and they are publicly professing that and being baptized. I pray for them and I pray for their families to support them in that. As we celebrate that life, that power, let us be open to who you are in our midst right now through the Holy Spirit to grow in you and to serve you with strength and boldness, but yes, also meekness and gentleness. Thank you, Lord, for calling us through your powerful name to be your servants and your children. And it's your name we pray. Amen. This is by far some of the most uh, important Sundays and the most exciting Sundays we have here at our church. Uh, the times where we can come together and tell the story visually of what Christ is doing in the lives of others. So I'm going to have four people who are being baptized. Why don't you join me here on stage? And as they're coming up, come on down and join me right across the stage here. And as they are coming, I'm going to tell you what's about to happen. Uh, we're going to hear stories and testimonies of their lives and their lives in Christ. And what is really, really incredible to hear are the stories of transformation and the difference that Christ is making. And uh, it's, these are incredible things that we do and hear about because we serve an incredible God. And what you're about to witness then later on is what we call believer's baptism. Uh, when In the Bible, it says that when people came to know their faith and accept Jesus Christ, they were then baptized. And so that's what's going to happen at the end of the service today. So before we get to that, though, we're going to ask uh, some questions and just kind of get to know the people who are going to be being baptized today. So why don't you tell everybody who you are? Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Mary, Mary Leonard. And Mary... Uh, how did you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Um, when I was in about the eighth grade, I had a really strong desire to know who Jesus was. I was raised in a family that had uh, a belief, and um, it, they taught me how to worship God, but I really didn't know or understand who God was or who Jesus was, and I had and had a Holy Spirit-inspired desire to find out who, who he was. And I went to classes, and all I was finding out was about religion, and that's not what I wanted. So many years later, um, in high school, a friend of mine invited me to a Bible study. And um, as my daughter would say, I looked at these kids, and they were so shiny. Um, they, were, they were filled with something that I wanted and something that I desired. And um, through them, um, I learned of a person, Jesus, and I learned of a personal God who cared about me and, and desired to have a relationship with me. And that's when I decided that, yeah, this is something that I want, and I made a commitment then. I didn't do very well with it, I will say. Um, but that's how I came to know him. So why now? Why at this point do you want to be baptized? Why is this important to you? Well, this is actually my third baptism, and, and I will explain that I was baptized as a baby um, graciously by my parents, which um, introduced me to the community of God, and um, 
then again when I was 29, I was pregnant with my first daughter, and I felt that if I did this, this was a righteous act, and it would make me a better Christian. It was kind of like what I was praying at the time, God, if you make my husband a better Christian, then I can be a better Christian, and it wasn't working. And um, so it, for me, and, and I'm going to, to kind of quote you, um, I was building my faith on my own righteousness. And this was an act that I thought, okay, if I do this, then I will be a better Christian and I can raise my daughter, or, or at that time I didn't know it was a daughter, to be a, a believer. And I went home. It was at a church where I had no community. I had um, no real family of believers to support me. And it didn't work um, because I was expecting it to be uh, this wonderful righteous act that I was doing. And as you, you had said last Sunday, I was building upon my own righteousness. And um, so I, what I have found since then is that I'm never going to please God by my own actions, no matter how good they are, unless the motives of my heart are right and the attitude of my heart is right. And so I have a, a scripture here that, that really came out to me from um, Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. And it goes on. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And so for me, this baptism is not so much about an action I'm doing. It's more about God's mercy and grace being, being showered upon me and um, my commitment to rely on his grace every day instead of my own righteousness. That's a beautiful testimony. That's beautiful. And the, these waters here, as you know, are not magical. These are average, average water we have here in a tank. But the story it tells is exactly what you've described, uh, his righteousness and uh, his story within you. Oh, beautiful. Well, I'll move down the line here and uh, go ahead and tell everybody who you are. My name is Max. And Max, how, what grade are you in, Max? Seventh grade. All right, seventh grade. And so how did you come to know um, Jesus Christ as your Savior? I came to know him through church by coming here. Okay, very good. And so why, is, why do you want to be baptized? Because Jesus died on the cross for us, so I want to wash away my sins and live for him. Exactly. And it's, it's a beautiful testimony, uh, what Jesus Christ did. And then that's what this symbolism is going to be here. You're going to be in the water, and you're going to go under, but you're not going to stay there. You're going to come back out of the water, hopefully. Um, <laughs> And what it symbolizes is the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection will also be our story, too, of our death one day. That's not the end of the story. Because of your faith in Christ, we will rise again and see him face to face. So that's a great testimony, Max. All right, I'm going to keep kind of moving down. We kind of slide some people down here. And uh, you're getting baptized today. Why don't you tell everybody who you are? I'm Landon. Hey, Landon. And uh, what grade are you in, Landon? Third. You're in third grade. And um, how did you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Because me and my dad were sitting on the porch one day after school, and we read the Bible for my homework. Okay, that's good. That's good. And in that Bible, it was talking about Jesus Christ, I imagine, too, right? So why do you want to be baptized? To show people that I follow God. Yeah. And that's a huge part of baptism, is being a t public testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful to have parents who point you in the direction of that, but this is your decision, and this is your time, and your baptism. This would be a great moment. Uh, thanks, Landon, for sharing. We'll keep sliding down here. We'll go ahead and tell everybody who you are. I'm Julie. Uh, what grade are you in? Oh, I'm, just <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, all right. So... How did you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, Julie? Um, I was raised in the church. I've gone since I was a baby, thanks to my parents. They took us every day, every, every Sunday. <laughs> um, so, and then um, it was high school. I went to an Acquire the Fire event in downtown Cleveland, and that's where I was first saved. 
And then in college, I was a religious studies major at Hiram, and I actually got saved a second time. And so, mm-hmm. and so. so why do you want to be baptized today? Why is this going to be important to you? Um, it's something that I've wanted to do for a long time, and I know what I've needed to do to further my relationship with Christ. And I've put it off because I created this crazy idea in my head that once I make this commitment, I had to be perfect. And if I wasn't, I was going to be a failure to God. And I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be a failure. So I've put it off and put it off. And I've since been reminded that um, it's impossible for me to be perfect. And I won't be doing this alone. So I'm excited. And it's beautiful because not only are you doing this for yourself, but you do this in the witness of all these people here who want to walk with you because none of us are, are perfect, um, but we walk as a community that are broken uh, but changed by the grace of God and his son, Jesus Christ. Beautiful testimonies. These are the stories of our people, and these are the people that are going to be baptized um, today. And so I'm going to have uh, Nick join me on stage. We're going to pray um, for everybody. Um, as they uh, yeah. need a microphone here, take this one. Right. Good morning, let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, so much for showing up again this morning. And I just wanna pray for all four of these and also the families that surround them and for the commitment that they have made to make a public profession of the faith that they have put in you. And while they go under the water and come back up again, they realize this doesn't save them. It doesn't really do physically anything, but it's more of a public profession of saying, hey, I, you know, Lord, I have accepted you. I ac- accepted the grace that you have shown me uh, to, to have eternal life through you. And then coming up out of that water represents what you did as we just sung about, how you, you went inside that tomb and then you rose again three days later. And that one day we have a promise that we will be with you, and that uh, we just celebrate with all four of these, that we all know them by name now, and you know them personally. You know their stories. Uh, We're not perfect. You don't expect us to be, but by witnessing this today, I pray that people would surround them, hold them accountable, and when they do fall, that they will look to you in the promise and the grace that they have received from you. In your name. Dear God, this is a beautiful testimony uh, of what you have done. All four of these lives transformed and changed for all of eternity because of your son, Jesus Christ. And so we are so grateful that we get to hear these stories. And we're also grateful that we get to participate and watch uh, baptism. And it's a beautiful picture that's been happening for thousands of years. People going under the water and coming up again. And that picture is a beautiful symbol of what your son did for us. We just sang about conquering death, conquering sin, so that we could have life. And so we are grateful as a church that we get to have a moment together to celebrate uh, with the four people on this stage. And in it, we are reminded of our own baptisms and that moment that takes us back in time. And maybe for some here, it will remind them of, man, I need to do that. And so, Lord, may all of us be encouraged uh, by what we will witness here today. Uh, You are good to us, and we love you, and uh, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Um, Many times uh, we have a baptism class. We go through these stories. We have them write it. We have them talk about it. And then um, we then get on stage, and it can be hard. So we're going to kind of help one another as we talk through uh, our stories here. So I want to go over on this side. I'm going to put you on hold there. All right? And uh, go ahead and tell everybody who you are. My name is Abriella. Abriella. And uh, what grade are you in, Abriella? Second. You're in second grade. And so how did you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Because I come to church and we read the Bible. That's right. You come to church here, and I know you read the Bible, and you're in class, and you have parents who are telling you about um, Jesus, the, the Savior, and the one who died on the cross for you. 
Now, all of us are sinful people. You are, Aubriella, I am, other people here are all sinners, and so that's why we need Jesus Christ um, to save us. So why do you want to be baptized? Because I know that it washes away your sin, and because I, I ask Jesus to be my heart, and I love him. Yeah. It's incredible, the story of being in that water. It's not magical water, but the water symbolizes. And it's, it's a great story. You're going to go under the water, and you're going to come back out. That's exactly what Jesus did. It's the story of Easter where Jesus died and he rose again. That's going to be our story too. Every single one of us who know Jesus, we will die. That's not going to be the end of the story. And that's not going to be the end of your story either, Abriella. And that's, a, that's something we want to celebrate uh, with you this morning. All right. Go ahead and tell everybody who you are. Hi, I'm Kate. And uh, what grade are you? Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, Kate... How did you come to know Jesus Christ? I grew up in a Christian household, coming to Sunday school, um, and then probably high school, college, I started to slip away and focused on other things like horses and just stopped coming to church and eventually hit rock bottom. Um, I really started talking to Christ and praying and just crying because I was so lost and didn't know what to do. And one of my friends um, texted me saying, hey, like, I'd like for you to come to my Bible study. It might be good for you. Okay, I'll give it a shot. I didn't click with anyone there. Um, I still felt this desire to figure out like what Christ is about, what all like I can learn and how he can help me get through life. And so my bosses, Carl and Nancy May, said they'd come to Riverwood. So I was like, well, I'll give it a shot. I'll go back there. And the first time I came back, I distinctly remember having you pray over me against the wall, bawling my eyes out. And that spark was lit. And now I just have an ongoing desire to figure out who I am as a person and how I can better myself with Christ. It's beautiful. So why do you want to be baptized today? Um, I realize that I have a purpose in life and I am unconditionally loved no matter like how imperfect I am and what I do correctly and incorrectly and I'm ready for a new walk with uh, faith and with Christ. This is a special moment because I knew you in the youth group and I've known you through the story and uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful moment that we're going to share together. All right, well, we're going to have some, uh, Sarah's going to join us, and we're going to pray uh, this morning for those who are being baptized. Go ahead, Sarah, why don't you start us, and then uh, we'll... Wanted to make sure it was on, sorry. <clears throat> Lord, I was reflecting on that song, Holy, 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 and how could a holy God <laughs> send his son here to walk with us, and, and even better yet, go ahead of us so that everything we do, you've already conquered. You've conquered salvation, you've conquered death, Lord, and even in baptism, we are just following you. So as these, Abriella and Kate, go in the water, they're really following you. They're going down into death, death to self, and they're being raised in newness of life, transformed into children of God. Thank you, thank you so much that you love us, that you never leave us, that you do everything in front of us so we just have to follow. So I pray over this baptism, I pray that as Kate and Abriella go forth and walk in newness of life, you will be displayed in every aspect. I pray this in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, this is not just a moment for Abriella and Kate, but this is a, a moment for your church. Uh, we get to come alongside and publicly witness what they are saying with their lives and their actions, that they are people who have been marked by the Savior. And that's significant because we know that we're not perfect, um, but yet they want to follow after you. And so I pray that this would be a great uh, moment for them to always look back upon and reflect upon the moment when they were baptized. I know for many of us here in the room, we are going back to that moment when we, too, were baptized. It speaks of the newness of life, and all of that is because of your son, Jesus Christ. And so we give you thanks, and we celebrate as a church what we are about to witness today. We pray this in your son's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, church, now we have an opportunity to join in worship through giving our our gifts, our offering this morning. And scripture calls us to do this with joyful hearts 
out of thanksgiving to God. And so even as we, as the plates are, as the baskets are passed and we're dropping those envelopes in, uh, this is an act of worship we do together as, as one body this morning. So you may be seated. Ushers, would you please serve us?
be seated. Well, good morning, church. Let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray together. Father, that is the message of the day. Hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. Lord, and no matter what we came into this place with today, would you remind us that the great message of baptism, that the great message of Ephesians is that your son is risen and we are invited in to that resurrection. Lord, I am inadequate for this moment to close out this incredible book. So, Father, would you be my adequacy today? And, Lord, would you open our ears to hear from you uh, what you have to say to us today? Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. And it's in the risen name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, if you're here today thinking, hey, they took my seat and moved it somewhere else, um, let me just tell you that the reason that we move things around is to put me on an elevated platform so you could see me above the four-foot baptistry. Um, Actually, uh, we've been filling up, which is a great, great thing, and uh, we wanted more room during Advent for you to be able to invite your friends to be at church with you. So um, please invite, and it's what a great time of year to renew uh, our commitment to Christ and, and definitely to the church. Well, good morning. Um, this is the 12th and final week of our series, United in Identity. And so I am playing the role this morning of Mariana Rivera, who was a closer for the New York Yankees, minus the Enter the Sandman theme song that he would come into. But Cole has preached the equivalent of a no-hitter over the last 11 weeks, and uh, that is a, a good thing. It's a masterpiece that he is, he's done. And, and so nothing like having to finish that out, but the, I will try to do that today. So, and today I know that you're here thinking one of three things. Either you're thinking about Thanksgiving and turkey and pumpkin pie and all that. How many are here thinking that? Okay, two of you. That's awesome. <laughs> or you're here thinking about Black Friday and all those incredible deals. Or you're here thinking about a football game that's going to happen this Saturday. I know one of those three things, but I thought, you know, we launch into the Christmas season this week. And so I thought we would start today with a top ten list. Top 10 ways you know you're a Black Friday person. All right, number 10. If you've ever taken a nap in your car the day after Thanksgiving, say it with me, you are a Black Friday person. If I would get it right, you could say it with me. Number nine. If your tablecloth for Thanksgiving dinner is circulars from the newspaper, you're a Black Friday person. What's a newspaper anyway? Number eight. If you order your pumpkin pie in a to-go box, number seven, if you've ever held to a plant-based diet, you're definitely, number six, if you think yams and sweet potatoes are the same thing, you're a Black Friday person. Number five, if you don't want giblets in your dressing, you're probably a Black Friday person. Number four. If you started your Christmas shopping on December 26th of last year, you're a Black Friday person. Number three, if you've ever watched the Griswold, or if you've already watched this season, the Griswold's Elf or any Macaulay Culkin movie, you're a Black Friday person. Number two, if you've ever paid $10 for a TV, <laughs> you're a Black Friday person. And number one, if you've ever injured another person at a Target store, or wanted to injure another person at a Target store, you're a Black Friday person, all right. And please know, this is a judgment-free zone, all right? You're, you're among friends here. Well, this is a big day. It's a day where we get to celebrate with six people their commitments to Jesus Christ. So let's buckle up and look at the last four verses of this great little book. And before we do, Let's take a look at where we've been at, at these last 12 weeks and Paul's uh, flow throughout the letter of Ephesians. Really, we want to look at where we've been in order that we can know 
where we're going and the way forward. Paul was never one to spend too much time looking back. Remember, this is the guy who said, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to reach for Christ Jesus. And yet, this same man spends about half of the letter of Ephesians reminiscing, thinking about there. He starts with way back when, recognizing this eternal God who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He reminisces about the Ephesian church and, and their experience of salvation, about the infolding of the Gentiles into one church, and very personally about his relationship with the building of the Ephesian church to this point. But then he gives us the next steps. He's the coach calling us forward, and he transitions back from way back there to the foundations of the world in Ephesians 4.1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And so he is saying, first three chapters, based on all that God has done for us and all that we've experienced as a church to this point, Based on this calling, we will walk like this. Or to quote a famous theologian, Stephen Tyler, walk this way. So how are we to walk? He says this, be a people willing to fight for your unity. Embrace your identity and your new humanity in Christ. Put off the old self and put on the new self. And let your new humanity in him guide who you are in your speech in your relationships, living as children of the light. Let not even a hint of. And these new humanity relationships are driven by this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And oh, if you're going to live fully in your new humanity in Christ, be ready and equipped for this battle that we're all in and do this through constant prayer. Paul is reminding us that once we were dead in our sins, but now in Christ, sin speaks a a dead language. So live forward because God has called you into this. He's equipped you for this. He's loved you in this from the foundations of the world. A big thought here in Ephesians is this. When we know where we come from and we know where we're going, we're likely to know who we are and where we are. In light of all that God has done for you. In light of this glorious standing you have as a child of God, in light of his great plan of the ages that God has made you a part of, in light of his plan for your growth and maturity in him, in light of the Holy Spirit whom he has given us, walk this way. Walk in the Spirit. We have been called in Christ, men and women, to remember the precious gift of salvation, and please note this as a church, to be distinctive, to be set apart, to stand out in this world as God's chosen people. So this is the journey of the book of Ephesians, and and now Paul concludes, beginning in verse 21, if you would read with me, Ephesians 6, 21. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So get this picture. Paul is in prison. He's dictating this to Tychicus, his his beloved friend. And, And it seems like to me that he is ending this rousing section with with a conclusion that's kind of anticlimactic here. I mean, who is Tychicus and and what is his story? But in this incredible, incredibly personal moment, Paul, the prisoner who has been dictating all this, says, hand me the pen to one of his best friends. We read about Tychicus five times in the New Testament. And honestly, His story seems insignificant based on what we read. But this was a man that was not insignificant on a historical level and definitely not on a kingdom level. Tychicus was probably a convert during Paul's ministry in Ephesus. So he likely witnessed the Ephesians riot. 
which prompted Paul's leave for Macedonia. We read about it in Acts chapter 19. He was with Paul uh, in, uh, when, he, when he decided to return to Jerusalem. He was one of the seven who accompanied him there. He was with Paul on his epic journey to Rome, which included his arrest and imprisonment in Caesarea. He was with him as he stood before kings and governors. He was with him as he was shipwrecked en route to Rome. And now he was with Paul as he's in Rome awaiting trial. And so this man who had been with Paul in all of these places, thousands of miles by land and by sea, this man who had been on this incredible journey with Paul was now being sent not only with this letter, but also the letter to the Colossian church and Paul's personal letter to Philemon. Nobody today would say, I came to Christ because of a man named Tychicus. Nobody took Tychican theology class in seminary. This was a nobody on a historical level who was simply faithful, devoted. And he came alongside a man named Paul who would change the world. And because of that, Tychicus also changed history. He had a low profile, but don't think that the role he played in in this kingdom life was insignificant. You see, Paul is saying goodbye to a beloved brother and faithful minister who would share all of this and more with the Ephesian church. He would conclude the story. And Paul closes the letter with these words, verse 23. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace Be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Really, this is the conclusion. And with this conclusion, Paul is framing the second half of the letter to the Ephesians. One in which he called them to unity in the church. To build the church together. To live out this new humanity in the culture at large. And as you do, be on your guard against the multi-directional powers of evil that will come against you. But here in this incredible conclusion, remember all of the divine resources of the immeasurable God that are available to you. Remember peace, faith, love, grace. Kent Hughes writes this, that, that there is nothing more revealing about us than what we wish for those that we love most. So here in these last verses, we read about Paul's wishes for the church. We see it often with our kids, don't we? We live in the direction of our wishes for them. If it's education, we live in that direction. If it's, if it's possession, if it's their relationships, if it's their profession, we live in the direction we hope for our kids and how we wish for those we love. And Paul's wishes for the church are, and, and through the church are summed up in these big, big four. First of all, he says, I wish you peace. I wish you peace. We're getting ready for a season where we're going to hear the words peace on earth a lot around here. It's, it's, it, we know it's Pastor Lon's favorite word, shalom. You're going to hear all over the place around here. And whenever we hear that word, it provokes a different response from every person hearing it. I think most of us want peace. We just are confused about the source of peace. And the vast majority of the ways in which we look for peace exclude the type of peace in which Paul is talking about here. Paul frequently defines peace as reconciliation. And that starts with reconciliation with God. Peace on earth can only be found with peace with God. And that can only be found through Jesus Christ. All through Scripture... Peace is not just the absence of conflict, but it is wholeness. It is well-being. It is this huge word, shalom. It's a state of thriving in our lives. I think the ironic blessing that we find in Numbers chapter 6 tells us about this peace, where it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you, say it with me, peace. But this whole new humanity that Paul has been talking about in Ephesians is not only about peace with God, but it's about the reconciliation of the church. It's about everybody becoming one. It's the type of peace where literally bitter enemies like Jews and Gentiles 
like Republicans and like Democrats, can become one in Christ. Paul's oneness with these Asian Christians wasn't just a mere theological concept. This was personal. He's saying, you are a part of me, and I am a part of you, and we are in Christ. One new humanity comes out of the two. But he also says this, I wish you love. Agape is used 14 times in the letter to the Ephesians, including three times in these two verses. And Paul defined this kind of love in his companion letter to the Colossians. He says, and above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You see, the very foundations of our newness in Christ is receiving this love, but also living on this love, this love that binds everything together. And I don't know about you, but I'm just going to talk about me here for a second. I think we stand on dangerous ground when we start to believe certain myths about God's love. What are these myths? It is limited. He won't love me if I do that. It is conditional. I have to measure up. It is seasonal. Maybe I'm walking through this dark place because... because I'm in a season where God is withholding his love. It is performance-based. God loves me when I'm doing well. And when we live out of any of these myths, it literally destroys the life of Christ and the love of Christ in us. But listen again to Paul's description of just how much we are loved. May we have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The fullness of God comes when we can begin to try to comprehend the height and breadth and depth and length of this love. He says, I wish you faith. It's a word that appears seven other times in this little letter, and faith is about two things. It is about belief, and it is about trust. There are, who, there are many who would say, I believe in God, but, but trust, you know, I like to trust what I can see. You see, I can believe in someone, I can believe in something intellectually, but not live as if my entire world revolves around him. You see, biblical faith is more than that. Trust is where we lean into this pursuing Jesus it's where we lean in with everything in our lives. It is I believe you, faith. And it is I trust you, faith, with everything. And finally, he says, I wish you grace. Grace is the undeserved favor of God. Grace is the very first word that he uses in the greeting of this letter and also one of the last words with which Paul leaves the church. The Greek word is charis, and it means gift. Ephesians 2 talks about this. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace is what God does through Jesus. Faith is our response to him. And this is not your own thing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Paul is finishing with the greatest hits of Ephesians, and normally he ends with this triangle of faith, hope, and love. But here he adds the word peace, and it's because of that reconciliation component we see here. And see, Ephesians begins with this look into the eternal past. From the foundations of the world you were chosen, and it ends with this look into the eternal future. And I, I thought it, it's interesting to look at the way that Paul ends all of his letters. Because I think it tells us something about the way he's ending Ephesians. So let me just bear with me for 30 seconds here. In Romans, he closes with the word amen. In 1 Corinthians, amen. In 2 Corinthians, a form of the word you. 1 Th Thessalonians, you. 2 Thessalonians, you. 1 Timothy you, 2 Timothy you, Titus you, Philemon you, Ephesians, incorruptible. One of these words is not like the others. 
See, the Greek word for incorruptible that, that's translated incorruptible here is the word aftharsia. And it's my new favorite word. Cole says I'm going to get it tattooed on my massive biceps this week. <laughs> but depending on your translation, uh, it means incorruptible, imperishable, undying, immortal. See, I see this word as just being a massive word, kind of like the wardrobe in Narnia where where it completely opens us up to a new world. Paul is describing the life of resurrection. And this is how he ends the book of Ephesians, both in the Greek and English. It's the first word of the resurrected life. And Paul is ending the book with a look into our immortal hope. It's as if Paul has spent the last six chapters defining our new humanity in Christ and says, oh, by the way, that life is immortal, it's imperishable, it's undying, it's incorruptible. Our new humanity in Christ will go on forever and ever and ever. So why would Paul end with a word that's all about beginnings? Love incorruptible is, first of all, simply how much we are loved. Do you ever just stop? Maybe it's a great week to do it. It's Thanksgiving week. To just stop and receive God's love and realize how much you are loved and and try to fathom. We can't, but try to fathom the height and depth and length and width of this incredible love that he has for us. Do you ever just try to stop and receive Do you ever stop and say, I am loved that much that he would send his son Jesus? See, all of us, I think, are simply on a search for one thing, and that is to find a place, to find a home where we simply know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we are loved like that. People run after it, they chase it, they long for it, and they're lost until they find it. Paul uses this word in many places, but never as an ending to the letter. Probably the most detailed understanding we read about in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, and what is raised is imperishable. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Verse 53. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So Paul uses this word swallowed often when talking about this concept, and it's so important to understand what he's saying here. Death is swallowed by victory. 1 Corinthians 15. The perishable is swallowed by the imperishable. The corruptible is swallowed by the incorruptible. The the dying is swallowed by the undying. The mortal is swallowed up by life. And if you think he's the only writer to do this, the writer of Hebrews does something similar when he says, the shakeable is being swallowed by the unshakable. So catch this. As the as the, corrupt, as the incorruptibility of creation that we read about in Genesis 1 and 2 is swallowed by the corruptibility of sin and death in Genesis 3 and 4, so the resurrection of Jesus has swallowed, all, has swallowed sin and death up. And it's a resurrection in which we get included. Paul uses that word in its opposite over and over to make a distinction between our present reality marked by sin and death and its rule and corruptibility and our future hope where death is absolutely, completely defeated, completely swallowed. And Paul says this, three very important words in Ephesians, put it on. Put on the resurrection of Jesus. This perishable, corruptible world is being swallowed by the kingdom that is life, immortal, incorruptible. Put it on. But how can that be? How can Paul end with words like love, incorruptible? I don't know about you. Again, I'm just talking about me here. But I feel like I'm way too fallen for that. 
I'm corruptible. I'm corrupted by sin, by pride, by appetites, by greed. But the Spirit of Christ is not. See, Ephesians tells us that we have been invited into this incorruptible love to live in a way that announces this incorruptible love to the world. But this new humanity is all about living in and loving him. In Romans 7, there's a picture of what life corrupted looks like. And in it, we kind of live with Paul in sin and through the law, trying to be good enough to overcome that sin. But we never get there in Romans 7 until we get to Romans 8. Where it says there is a change. Because of grace, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the Spirit of Christ is in us. Incorruptible. I think this last word of Paul is him inviting us to live in a world that is, uh, who, who live in a world that is so corrupted by sin and death into a life and a love that is absolutely incorruptible. And Paul is saying that in this world, you and I have a hope that is incorruptible. There is a truth that is incorruptible, immortal. And Paul dares to talk about that love that is incorruptible, that is available to us, and we are invited to live in. I want to note this. We're invited to live in today. Not up there someday, but we're invited to it today. You see what he's doing? Paul is closing the incredible conversation of Ephesians with an eternal ellipses, saying that our mortal, corruptible lives are being swallowed by an eternal kingdom, that what is mortal is being swallowed up by life. What if what we're currently experiencing looks nothing like the life he's defining, resurrection life? A life that can only be defined by the resurrected Jesus after the grave. Because he is our forerunner, the one who shows us about life and who defines this life. You see, there's this scene in the Gospel of John after Jesus has called out to Lazarus, come forth. And and Lazarus Lazarus comes out of the grave. And I've always thought it odd that the very next words he says are these. Take off the grave clothes. Take off the grave clothes. You see, he's calling him out and he's alive, but he's still dressed in death. And I think so often it's easy to live in this life with our grave clothes put on, to live in the direction of our mortality. What if Paul is calling us in Ephesians today to let our thinking be swallowed up in life and all we can do is give our thinking to what is mortal? What if he's calling us to let our words and our speech be swallowed up in life and all we're talking about is what is mortal? What if he's calling us to let our very existence be swallowed up in life and we've given everything to what is mortal? See, here is the good news for us from Ephesians. We have an eternal, imperishable, immortal, incorruptible hope and Paul says take the grave clothes off by his grace and put it on. And honestly, nothing could speak better to what he's talking about than the, than the act we get to participate in today of baptism. See, it's, it's this beautiful act where we symbolically embrace and put on our new life in him by his grace, dying to the old self and alive to the new. It is a covenant act in which the immeasurable, immortal, incorruptible, undying God looks at us and says, you're mine. And where we look back at him and say, I'm yours. And where we look at one another and say, I'm yours. We are one in Christ. We are this new humanity in him. Because when we know where we've come from, before the foundations of the world, you were chosen. And we know where we're going. We've been called into this incorruptible hope and love. We have a better idea where we are and who we are now. You see, today, this baptism pool physically sits in this room on November the 24th, 2019. But it's announcing decisions 
and commitments from God to us made before the foundations of the world and us to him that are not bound by our physical lives on this earth. They're not time bound. So while we live in this corruptible world, we've been invited to an incorruptible kingdom. We've been invited to a hope that is incorruptible, a grace that is incorruptible, a faith that is incorruptible, a a truth that is incorruptible, a future that is incorruptible. I don't know about you, but that's incredible news on Thanksgiving week. The invitation of our Lord. We often joke, and I probably joke with every person I take through baptism class, that the Holy Spirit tells them as we're immersing them how long we're going to leave them under the water. And and it, it is a joke, all right? So if you're thinking about baptism, that is a joke. But really, we understand that what's under the water is, is corruptible, right? It's everything that we're dying to. It's where we participate in the death of Jesus. But, what, but, but that's not where baptism ends, is it? And it would, be a, it would be a sad reality for all of us if that's where baptism ended. But we bring them up representing this incorruptible future and hope that we have in him that because this is an important concept in Ephesians, we are in Christ. That in-ness never ends. And we are raised to a hope that is immeasurable. He says incorruptible, undying. And all we can do is say thanks. Give him thanks today. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, I pray on this week of Thanksgiving, as we head into Advent, that we would realize that we don't have a hope that is good for 60, 70, 80, 90 years. But we have a hope that is forever and ever in you. That we don't have a love available to us that is measured, but we have a love available to us that is immeasurable. That we are not being called into a, a faith of martyrs, but we're being called into a faith of those who are alive in Christ. That we're not being called to divide, but we're called to be one in you. And so, Lord, our only response to you today is to say say thank you. It's to give you thanks for what you have done, for how you've loved us, and ask you for the strength to walk in this new humanity together in you, to be aware of what you're doing, of what you're saying in us, and to realize that you've placed before us an ellipsis, life without end, Love without measure. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the truth of this incredible book. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
chapter 1. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all.
Church, we've been invited in. We've been invited into this immortal hope. We've been invited into this future. We've been invited into this new humanity that he offers to us today. And we say praise, praise the Lord and give him thanks together. We want to let you know that next week is the first Sunday of Advent. And we are do, uh, having Converged Sunday, so it will be all generations worshiping together in this place, and we get to share in communion next week. It's going to be a great day to begin celebrating Christmas and Advent together. But before we go today, we want to say our benediction uh, from Ephesians 3. Let's say it together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go and pursue Jesus this week.